You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. One of the biggest issues we have is Medicare, health care spending, the whole ball of, ball of wax there. A number 20 years ago, we crossed the Rubicon to where about 45% of money that's spent on Medicare does not come from the Medicare tax that you pay in every paycheck. It comes out of the general budget. Now, that number has probably gone up uh, since then, but it's it's been that way where it's been a long time since we've actually paid for Medicare out of the Medicare taxes. And uh, there does need to be some improvement on Medicare. And Dean Clancy's joining us right now. He's from Americans for Prosperity. He's a senior health policy fellow. And we're going to talk about modernizing Medicare. Uh, they did a bit of that in the 90s, but that was a long time ago. Dean Clancy, welcome. How are you? I'm great, thanks. So I'm married to a primary care physician. He's retired now. He he actually is semi-retired. He's got he's the doc at the jail now, which is fantastic because he has no Medicare, no Medicaid, no insurance. He just gets paid at the first of the month, which is great, oh, wow. which is wonderful in the world that we live in today. But um, you know, Medicare is a huge portion of of our Medicare, med, our medical costs in America. And in the old days, way back, Medicare was a par- portion of insurance payments, the payments for Medicare. But now they sort of lead the way. So it's this behemoth that just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. What are your thoughts about modernizing Medicare? What could we do? Because people say it's the third rail, but we've got to have this discussion. Absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. Medicare is a big deal. It, you know, about 60 million Americans, six zero, um, rely on Medicare uh, for their health insurance. And um, its payment rates tend to influence everybody else's in the entire system. So uh, Medicare is very important. The hospital trust fund, Medicare relies on two trust funds, one for hospitals, one for everything else. The hospital trust fund gets no money from the general fund, it's going broke, and it'll be exhausted in 10 years on our current trajectory. When that happens, then uh, Medicare will have to cut what it pays to doctors and and only pay based on what's coming in uh, through the payroll tax, and that's going to mean severe problems uh, for hospitals and for seniors who rely on hospital care. Uh, President Biden is proposing to solve that problem by raising the payroll tax uh, significantly, but that will just kill jobs and burden working people. He also wants to cut Medicare, uh, but he's doing it in a bad way. He's cutting benefits rather than trying to cut out waste. That's really the answer to your question, is we need to go after the waste and inefficiency in Medicare, and there's specific ways to do it. Uh, Mr. Biden wants to cut Medicare Advantage. That's the part of Medicare, uh, very popular, where you can get extra benefits at no or low additional cost uh, if you get your Medicare through a competing private insurance plan. So people get dental, vision, hearing, and so on for very little, and they get it extra through Medicare Advantage. It's optional. Half of the people in Medicare have signed up for it. Mr. Biden wants to cut it significantly, and that's going to mean those benefits go away for a lot of those people. Uh, the, The better way to fix Medicare is to go after the waste and inefficiency. And if I can give you just one example, right now Medicare pays hospital-based physicians about three times what it pays independent community-based physicians for the exact same service. It makes no sense. It's just a, you know, an artifact of past uh, history and uh, crony lobbying and you know, special interest influence. It needs to end, and if you did that, you wouldn't reduce access for seniors, but you would uh, help pr- prolong the life of the Medicare program. That's what we should be doing, not what President Biden is suggesting. Yeah, and I know some of these Advantage plans, I mean, my in-laws are 91 years old, and they, um, 
have one of these Advantage plans, and they actually get like these cards like it's like a visa card with money on it and it's it's really more than what they're paying out in premiums and it just seems to me is somebody's got to be making a lot of money somewhere to be able to afford to do that sure uh the medicare advantage plans are private competing insurance plans they deliver all the standard medicare benefits and additional benefits how can they afford to do that primarily because they're more efficient than a bureaucracy. Traditional uh, 1960s style Medicare is basically a central bureaucracy, you know, writing checks and trying to set prices and guessing and often getting it wrong, whereas the competing insurance plans actually have to compete for seniors' business. That keeps them on their toes. Now, there is definitely an argument that uh, the Advantage plans are being overpaid under current formulas, and I think that's uh, true, but I think Uh, We can repair that without impairing access uh, to those plans. Mr. Biden just wants to take a meat ex to Medicare Advantage, and that would hurt seniors. So is there any appetite in the Congress to actually do reform much like we did in the 90s? Because in the 90s, when they I think it was a huge plus for Medicare when they added a lot of the wellness checkups and those kinds of things that catch things early. I think that was a very positive step, but it didn't seem like they changed anything else. Um, But is there an appetite in Congress now to be able to work on this? I would say that uh, it's starting to turn around. Uh, Mr. Biden is running for re-election on uh, what, what I call Medi-Scare. He's, he's trying to accuse the Republicans of wanting to take away people's Medicare. That's not true at all. Uh, in the debt ceiling debate that's going on right now, he said, we're going to keep Medicare off the table. No cuts to Medicare as part of that discussion about how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, pay the nation's bills. Medicare or uh, Republicans have basically said, fine, that's fine. But I think there's a growing appetite to actually reform Medicare so that the trust fund is not exhausted in 10 years. You know, one of the ideas that uh, Republicans talk about a lot is raising the retirement age, the age at which you first are eligible for Medicare uh, benefits. Uh, That would certainly save money. It's not very popular. I think a lot of people uh, would rather, you know, they want to be able to, to get on to Medicare at age 65, not have to wait until they're 67 or something like that. Another idea, which I think is probably more popular, is to not pay Medicare benefits to people who really, really don't need them. I'm talking about billionaires and uh, multimillionaires, people who can certainly afford their own uh, health care well, costs. It's funny, um, one of our uh, doctors here in town. He's passed away now. His name was P.K. Dixon. He was an old school general surgeon. Uh, and I remember when I first met him, when I we moved to town in the early 90s, and he got up at a medical association meeting and said, I'm a rich old doctor. Why can't I pay my own way if I want to? And I think there's right. a lot of people out there that would do that if you know, if they were given the opportunity to do it. And I, I, as far as the change in age, I mean, we went through this with Social Security, right? So I'm in that, right. I'm 67 and or 66 and 10 months or whatever is when I can right. uh, first start drawing. And we, we stair-stepped it in. And if we did change the age, it wouldn't be that people currently on Medicare wouldn't get it. It would probably be some right. sort of thing where they started with people that were under 50 and then stair-stepped it up. That's right. That's right. Yeah, the the downside of doing it that way is that you don't get any immediate uh, savings. Um, you know, you have to plan way out in the future. That and you're right. They did that for Social Security. I'm in the group that uh, I don't get it until I'm 67, and um, that's fine. You know, I can. We we accepted that as a, a national uh, policy. That's fine. I think the beauty of the the means testing that I was talking about about not giving benefits to billionaires is you can get savings immediately, and it doesn't take benefits away from anybody who is truly vulnerable or dependent on them. And um, so I'm hopeful that ideas like that can be discussed, plus the reduction in waste and inefficiency that I mentioned. There's a bunch of things that can be done, and um, it doesn't have to be political. Unfortunately, President Biden, I think, perhaps because he doesn't really have any good issues to run on, he really can't run on inflation jobs, crime, foreign policy. So he's resorting to uh, 
defining his opponents negatively by accusing them of trying to take away people's Medicare when, in fact, I see no sign of Republicans wanting to do that at all. But, you know, the people who vote are older people. I mean, they have the highest right. turnout of voting, and their benefits are kind of guaranteed through the system. They don't have to fight for them every year. And so it's easy to scare those folks. And look, I'm on my way there, okay? I'm 63, so I'm on my way there. <laughs> but um, but I, I just hope that uh, if you're listening out there today, and it doesn't matter what age you are, that you would let your congressman know and your senators know that you want to see negotiation on this. You want to see whether it's a negotiation on the debt ceiling or a negotiation on Medicare, that you want to see that happen. Uh, because until they hear from their constituents, they're not going to move on this, Dean. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, you know, uh, uh, policy making doesn't happen without the public making their opinions known. And I think one of the reasons politicians have been hesitant to touch Medicare is because they're not hearing anything in favor of reforms. They only hear, oh, don't touch my benefits. Well, no one's going to touch your benefits, uh, but somebody has to be the adult who says, you know what, we need to make some reasonable uh, changes that keep this program going so so that it's there for people. You know, I hate to ever, like, lift up Canada because I think they do a lot of things wrong. But in the 90s, they made some big adjustments to some of their social programs. And it has, you know, while they, they have problems like everybody else does, it really was was uh, farsighted. And they are in better shape than a lot of other places now because of that. And um, we sure. need to do that, too. We need to do that, too. Absolutely. It's long overdue. Uh, reforming Medicare and, and uh, you know, cutting government spending to reasonable levels, reducing debt and uh, the deficit, those are just things that have to happen. And I do think the public is swinging in that direction. And, uh, of course, we have to get inflation under control. That That's a terrible tax that hits seniors and people on a fixed income hardest and, uh, and low-income people. So there's a lot to be done. And my hope is in this election um, we'll have responsible conversation and not just demagoguery. Uh, at Americans for Prosperity, that's what we try to do is help get uh, people into positions of uh, policymaking who uh, want to remove barriers between you and the American dream and who you know believe in common sense. And um, so that's what we're going to be working on. Dean Clancy, Americans for Prosperity, thanks so much for being with us today. If people want to know more or find out more about what Americans for Prosperity is doing, how can they find that out? Well, there's two websites that I'll uh, give you. One is our main website, americansforprosperity.org. And the second one, if you want to learn more about Medicare and health care, and our, we, we call it our personal option philosophy, our approach to reforming health care, Without more government, it's uh, personaloption.com. I'll I'll repeat that, personaloption.com. Absolutely. Dean Clancy, thanks for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and of course... President Biden doesn't resemble the President Biden that was a senator, that was a vice president, or anybody else as he's relating to this debt ceiling discussion. And Democrats are out there calling it one thing. But Kevin McCarthy, who, you know, I wasn't 100 percent sure about, has done a decent job on this particular package. Steve Moore is joining me today about the debt ceiling discussion and the economy. You know, it. I'm kind of in the Rand Paul camp, Steve, where I think we ought to go back to the 2019 budget and kind of build from there. But I think this proposal that McCarthy's put out there kind of checks the boxes because we've we've incurred a lot of debt, both under President Trump and under President Biden. Yep. I couldn't agree more, Mark. I th- and I'm not always a big cheerleader for Kevin McCarthy. I've had some run-ins with him in the past, but I think he's doing exactly the right thing here. You know, the, the, uh, there's only, what, 221 Republicans, so they only have about a four or five seat majority. So there's not a lot of room for error here. He's got to get virtually all Republicans to sign on. It looks like he's got it. I, I you know, can't guarantee it until that vote happens. And it, what's the latest? Is it supposed to happen today or? I've heard that it's going to happen today, but you know, you never yeah. know. 
Yeah, they won't vote. I mean, they won't have the vote until Kevin McCarthy has the vote. So, uh, it, you know, the, the sooner the better. And look, if you listen to the histrionics from the Democrats, I mean, my gosh, it's going to cause blood in the streets and children are going to go hungry and hospitals are going to close down and it's kill, kill kittens. And I mean, it's unbelievable how uh, apocalyptic the Democrats are and over the top in their rhetoric on this. They are especially opposed to I don't understand why, but they're really opposed to work requirements for welfare, which is something 80 percent of Americans are in favor of. I mean, we want a safety net, but we also want people to get off the couch and, and get working hey, when Jim, there are jobs I thought out back there. in the days of welfare reform in the 90s, we had that. Um, we did. Did we but lose that, it? it what, yeah, Obama started to peel it back. And then what happened is under, under COVID, all of the Biden – uh, basically repeal all of the work requirements so that we virtually have very few work requirements now. And incidentally, the, the evidence is concrete and clear that when we did work requirements back in the mid-1990s, and, and incidentally, you had the same kind of um, outrageous rhetoric from the Democrats when it passed under a Democratic president, by the way, Bill Clinton. And what we saw was a big reduction in poverty, a big reduction in the number of people collecting welfare, and a, uh, a lot of people paying taxes, not collecting benefits, which is you know what we want in America. And so uh, work requirements are important. I think it's really, really important that we not give $40 billion more money to the IRS to hire 87. 7,000 new IRS agents. It's important that we have a pro-America energy policy, which would raise money and create jobs. It's important that we put a cap on spending. And I am with you, Martha. I like, and, and with my friend, Rand Paul, my favorite senator, who says, let's go back to the pre-COVID baseline before we spent these trillions and trillions of dollars. And that would basically balance the budget. Um, but this is a good start. And I want them to get this bill over to the uh, Chucky Schumer over in the Senate and then let the Democrats deal with it, because Biden is basically acting like a seven year old child. And he's folding his arms and saying, I'm not going to negotiate on this. Well, you know, what are you talking about? This is a democratic system. You know, who, who's the threat to democracy here when he's not even going to, you know, he's threatening to basically, uh, you know, cause, uh, you know, a shutdown of the government and so on because he won't negotiate when it's the six trillion dollars that we have to raise the debt ceiling by. Guess who, who was the sponsor of all that spending? It was Biden. Absolutely right. Now, what's the sense about Chuck Schumer? I mean, I've heard Manchin say he likes the package. Um, in general. Now, granted, when it comes right down to it, Joe Manchin ends up voting like a Democrat. We know yeah, that. Right. But right. he's saying that he likes the package. Um, what do you think Schumer's going to do? Well, I think what Schumer's going to try to do is pass what's called a clean debt ceiling bill, which is just give the government an, an increase in their debt limit without any conditions, which is crazy. Look, if you, Martha, if you were in debt, and you went into a bank and said, oh, you know what? I'm running a big debt right now. I'm losing money. So give me another loan. I mean, the bank is going to say, okay, what's your plan to get rid of your debt? <laughs> and they're not going to give you a loan unless you have a plan. Right. Biden saying, increase my debt limit, and I don't have a plan, which is outrageous. And it's irresponsible. And I think most thinking Americans agree that to just give Biden an extension on the credit card limit without any plan at all, basically saying, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and, 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 you know, running us into national bankruptcy. I don't think that's a very smart plan. So, you know, you talk about most reasonable Americans and you look right. at polling and you see only, I think the Wall Street Journal had a poll that said only 5% of people want to see a matchup between former President Trump and President Biden yeah. again. That 51% Wait, of what, Democrats, what was that number? 5%. 5%. <laughs> that's only 5% want to rematch. <laughs> yes. Well, guess what? The, the betting odds are right now, because I just had an item in our hotline today. I was looking at the latest betting lines, which are the most accurate, you know, predictions yes. you can have. And it, it's a 50-50 chance we're going to have, yes. uh, according to betting lines. So a, where, where are those regular Americans? Why aren't they engaging? Because 51% of Democrats said they didn't want Biden to win. I mean, to run. So, run. Know. Uh, you know, it seems like... I. I don't I kind of feel like and maybe this is my wishful thinking is that we're going to have kind of a resurgence of the silent majority, I hope, and that they're going to get out there and start voting their pocketbook, which is going to be good for us. So uh, 
I think it's sad for the country that, uh, and by the way, as if I were speaking as a partisan Republican, and I'm a pretty much of a, you know, I'm not a rah rah Republican, but I do want the Republicans to win. If I could handpick who I want to run against, well, my first choice would be Kamala Harris, and my second choice would be Joe Biden. So uh, if I just wanted, you know, what was best for the Republican Party, go, Joe, run, 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 because I, don't, I just don't think Americans are going to vote for an enfeebled man to be president for four more years. He can barely make it through this term. But it's bad for the country. It's just bad for the country if he runs again. Uh, and, you know, we can't have a weak president in these times of turbulence, both weak economically and weak, you know, from a foreign policy perspective. And so, um, you know, and by the way, you know, there are a lot of Republicans who, want, who do not want Donald Trump to be the nominee. And I'm, I'm kind of undecided about it. I haven't made up my mind who I support for the Republican side of the aisle but come on, this is the best the Democrats can come up with. Uh, a guy who, and by the way, I'm not trying to be snide here, but let's face it. I mean, he, you know, he's 80. I'm, I'm 63. I'm already feeling the effect of, of, you know, getting older. I don't quite have the energy I did, and, and I'm getting a little forgetful. And so, you know, we can't, we can't run a, uh, you know, $23 trillion economy with someone who is not, you know, mentally fit for the job. So that's where we're at right now. And by the way, I love the title of the Wall Street Journal piece yesterday about this, which is four more years. Sounds like a prison sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, too, on the Republican side, clearly we've got, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy. We've got Nikki Haley. We've got Tim Scott looking at it. We've got Chris Christie looking at it. we got Ron DeSantis yeah. finally answering some of this stuff that's been said about him and looking at yeah. it. Right. Um, and then, of course, we got Trump that's all in. So, yeah. you know, if 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 you want to look at at a at a ticket that looks more like America, it's on the Republican side. I mean, that's really what you know, it's more reflective of where America is, is on the Republican side. Well, I think, you know, the case for Trump and, and I, again, I'm undecided about this uh, is that he can just say, look at how much better the country was four years ago when I was president than it is today. And that's going to be his, you know, his, his line over and over again. If you want more of what Biden's done, you know, then vote for him. But if you want to return to prosperity, then vote for me. But, you know, Trump has, I've always said this, Martha, and I'm a friend of Donald Trump's and he's always tre- treated me well. I just saw the president a few weeks ago, but he is his own worst enemy. Mm-hmm. Martha, you know that, you know, and so we'll see whether he can, tone it down a little bit <laughs> to appeal to those, you know, moderate uh, independent voters that he's going to need if he's going to win. Well, you know, ironically, a couple of weeks ago when he did that interview with Tucker Carlson, you know, the name that shall not be mentioned um, uh, after all the stuff that's happened to him. Uh, and I'm being facetious there. Uh, if people I heard so many people say after that interview that he did mostly about foreign policy. Uh, the former president was that if he would be like that between yes, now right. that it right. would be fine, but can yes. he be like that? I, I don't know. I mean, can a tiger change its stripes? I don't know. And I, you know, I've been around Trump for six years now, and as I said, there's a good and a bad and ugly about Trump. And I always say my prayers. I hope the good triumphs over the ugly. So Absolutely. I, you know, I met Joe Biden in '08 when he was running for president, and then I met President Trump for the first time in in 2012 when he was thinking about running for president. Yeah, right. And. Many of, you know, they're very similar, at least the Joe Biden of 08, who was a lot more dynamic and a lot more together than he is now. I mean, they both were kind of people that you noticed when they came in the room. They had a big personality, not so much for Biden anymore. I mean, he has deteriorated a lot since 08. And and they were similar kind of guys. And I always finish it by this. They're guys that used to be really good looking and still think they are. And that's kind of where I can say that you can't. But they're they're dominant in a room. And Trump still sort of has that. I mean, he is definitely if you look at him oh, compared sure. to Biden, yeah. he doesn't yeah. seem to be aging at all as far as as that goes. Uh, but it's interesting to follow. And I look, I probably will ultimately I'm like you. I haven't decided who I'm going to support in the primary. I will. I'm kind of in the Bill Barr world that if it's the choice between a progressive and Donald Trump, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump again. But it's I want to see a better Donald Trump. I do. Me, me too. I think we all do. I think that's well said. And, you know, will he behave himself and will he be a little kinder and gentler? Uh, I, I kind of I don't know. I don't. You know, Trump is Trump. And 
he, but boy, he has such a huge, follow, you know, loyal following among you know Republican voters. Right but you now, know what? You know, I don't care who you are. If you are supporting somebody, no matter what, that is dangerous. Yeah. It is well, dangerous. That's a good point. To never I question see, yeah. someone. Yeah. I want to see how he performs, you know, and yes. how he acts over the next. You know, look. Remember, it's still. This is still April. It's early. I know. Yeah, so we can, well, you so know, we I know the, months, so. the bookmakers are not behind me on this, but I think that by South Carolina, one or both of those guys will not be in the race anymore. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. I hope you're right. Well, I hope <laughs> that person who's not in the race is Joe Biden, I, because I really did think it would be tragic for the country if, you know, if he were reelected. It is tragic and then, for by the him, way, what too. Would happen, it's, yeah, and if 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 he picks Camel again as his you know running mate, that means a high probability that she would because he's not going to make it. Come on, what are what are the chances he could make it through another four years? Not likely. Not yeah. likely. So that means you know Camel Harris is going to be the president of the United States. I mean, that's a nightmare. We shall see, Steve Moore. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us today. Okay, see ya. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Shondell Summers here with me today in the studio. And on the phone for us today is Senator John Ossoff. We always love welcoming welcoming him to the Martha Zoller Show. Welcome, Senator Ossoff. Hey, Martha. How you doing, my friend? How's your family? Everybody's great. I mean, I can't complain. We've we've we were all under one roof together a few weeks ago, and we're still talking. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I uh, got back into Georgia late last night and uh, got a little bit of time with my baby daughter this morning. So I'm feeling great. That's great. Good for you. Listen, I know you wanted to talk about military families and veterans and some updates for them. So let's just start with that, and then I've got a couple of questions on the debt ceiling. Sure. Well, look, let me, let me talk first of all about the mental health access challenges that military families are facing. And uh, as any active duty personnel or veterans and military families who are listening know, uh, those families rely upon TRICARE for their health insurance. Uh, but whether it's emergency mental health care for some kind of acute crisis or it's uh, you know, uh, treatment for a, a child struggling with autism, um, or uh, therapy services. Military families are having a lot of difficulty affording mental health care, even with TRICARE. Uh, and military families have a particular need for these services, given the stress that they're under and the difficulties we see around mental health in the armed forces. So I've just introduced some bipartisan legislation with my Republican colleague, Senator Kramer of North Dakota. It's called the Military Families Mental Health Services Act. And this will substantially increase the access military families have to free mental health services uh, for outpatient services outside of the military health care system. So if they need to go get these services, I don't want a three or four hundred dollar copay to keep them from doing so. I'm uh, trying to bring Republicans and Democrats together to get this done so that our service members, their spouses and their kids can get the mental health care service that they need. And I know you've been working hard on our veterans, too, and the, the issues that are related to them. Um, and I know you've got some updates related to that. Yeah, look, a couple of important points I want to make sure folks hear. First of all, uh, I passed last year similar legislation focused on veterans. So to ensure that veterans uh, can access uh, up to three uh, mental health appointments, uh, or services outside of the VA per year without any copay. Working very hard to try to drive down these wait times that are just unacceptable for veterans throughout the system. And in the meantime, we can't let cost get in the way of a veteran's access to mental health services, particularly not, and I know this is a tough and sensitive conversation, but particularly not with the high levels of, of suicide and self-harm that we see among some of our veterans. So access to mental health services, I was able to pass that bipartisan legislation last year. I'm following up on that now with this legislation focused on active duty service members, guard and reserve personnel, and their families. And then, of course, as you know, Martha, I have been focused uh, very intently on the conditions of housing for uh, families living on post at Fort Gordon. And we made some major progress 
uh, in the last few weeks. I persuaded the Army to individually inspect every single home on post. That's going to take about four weeks. I went out there myself to personally oversee the beginning of these inspections. But, you know, our, our military families make such extraordinary sacrifices for all of us. Uh, they should not have to sacrifice a safe, clean, and healthy home. And I'm continually working to try to break through all of the partisan nonsense in Washington. It doesn't matter what the letter after your name is. We're all Americans, and we owe uh, much more attention and care to those who serve and those who have served. I know shondell has got a question for you in just a minute, but I wanted to ask you a question about um, the debt ceiling. Uh, you know, of course, the House passed... Um, what they say, yet the president has said, show us your plan, and that's what the Republicans in the House did. But they went through the process. They got the vote. Um, you know, we've got lots of, of – of, I have a real big issue with all the 80-year-olds that are running parties, okay? And, and and I don't want to be critical of people because of their age because I hope to get there someday. But you've got the leader of your party as well as the leader of, of the Republican Party in different places saying things like they're not going to negotiate. They're not going to come to the table. You've got to do it this way or we're not going to talk. But yet over the years they have said, hey, we have to go to the table. We have to negotiate. So... I I just really want to see, especially because you and Senator Warnock are, are you know, kind of representing a swing state, representing a 50-50 state. And so you've got just as many people in your constituency that really want you to come to the table as those that may say don't come to the table. And I know it puts you in a challenging position, but where are you on this debt ceiling deb- deb- debate? And are you working to bring people to the table? Because you got to start somewhere if you're going to negotiate. Well, I think a lot of Georgians and a lot of Americans, by the way, who I believe increasingly identify as politically independent and not aligned with one party or the other, share the frustration that you're expressing about the constant partisan bickering when there are really important economic issues at at stake. And, you know, I think that uh, if cooler heads and a more mature approach could prevail, then uh, the the way to, to look at this is, The United States is not going to default on obligations that it's already made. And we have a federal appropriations process, as you know, Martha, from your days working in the Senate. uh, That appropriations process requires each House of Congress, whichever party controls each. Right now we have a Republican House and a Democratic Senate to sit down and work out a plan for the federal budget that accommodates every district's needs, every state's needs, and that secures our long-term fiscal sustainability. Uh, playing with fire with a default on on U.S. sovereign obligations with potentially catastrophic uh, consequences, I think, is is irresponsible, as is uh, the refusal through the annual appropriations or budget process to find bipartisan common ground. So, you know, I, you, you mentioned that I, I represent a politically diverse state, and, and I do, and I, and I work very hard to steer clear of the partisan hoopla in Washington. I think people are absolutely sick of it. I think that the level of division and polarization in America is uh, a threat to our national security. The level of political hatred in our society is out of control. We have got to remember that we are all Americans, that while we can have raucous disagreements about public policy and our democracy is meant to accommodate that and to mediate that, We ultimately share the same interests. We ultimately all want the United States to succeed. When I look at my little baby baby daughter in the morning, uh, she's not thinking about the world in terms of which political party is winning. She's going to be inheriting a world that we're going to have to build by coming together, finding common ground, and getting things done. And I, I hope, I think you've seen, Martha, that that's the spirit and the approach that I bring to my representation of Georgia. Good morning, Senator Ossoff. I'm Shondell Summer, and um, I just wanted hey, to men- I, I wanted to mention we've met before at uh, Fran Collins' holiday party a couple of years ago. So um, great to speak with you. Yes, nice to meet you too. And um, I wanted to ask you about an assault weapons ban because I don't get up in the morning worrying too much about the price of eggs. I get up in the morning worrying about whether or not someone's going to shoot me. I I now have sort of developed a paranoia every time I see someone. I think, are they just some crazy person out here with an assault weapon? What is the Congress going to do about that? 
Well, given that we have a divided Congress, we are going to, as we just discussed in the context of economic policy, find common ground. And I think that the overwhelming majority of Americans and the overwhelming majority of Georgians understand that firearms are not toys. They are lethal tools, and their ownership comes with responsibilities uh, for safe stewardship, storage, and use. And we can uphold American Second Amendment rights while empowering our law enforcement and public safety officials to reduce the completely unacceptable level of gun violence in our society. And I think that universal background checks would be a great place for the Congress to start. I see no reason why any of my colleagues in either party should not support a common sense background check for a criminal history, for example, or other red flags that suggests some imminent threat of violence in order to purchase a firearm. But haven't the last few mass shootings involved people who got the gun legitimately and that did go through background checks? Because how do you stop that? Look, we passed gun safety legislation last year, however, Shandell, that strengthened background checks for under 21 purchasers of firearms. And uh, the FBI has briefed Congress about the number of folks who had red flags in their background uh, that might otherwise not have been caught. So it is not a perfect or the only solution, but where, you know, as we just discussed in the context of the economy, we've got to find common ground. I- I'm looking at what's achievable, and I don't see yeah. any reason why this Congress should not be able to agree to pass a law that requires background checks for firearms purchases. You know, I I mean, and I think this is a one of those issues where we have to get together and talk about it and you all did do something last year which you know you've got to give that time to to work through and i do believe that um there are concerns out there i mean i've i've had discussions in my bible study group where uh there are grandparents in my group that are saying do i need to discuss these kinds of things with um you know discuss these kinds of things with my grandchildren or my children uh about how to be safe so it's an important issue and we want to have you back definitely to talk about this uh but i want to finish up just kind of talking about the things we always do like how people can can get in touch but first do you see movement on the debt ceiling debate because i know i know you're committed to working with all sides but is there some movement now that there's at least a plan in play Look, I think folks are pretty dug in at the moment. Um, But the bottom line is that uh, default on U.S. financial obligations. I mean, just I want to make clear to folks, I know you know this, Martha, what that would mean, what it would mean for interest rates and inflation, what it would mean for homeowners. We're we're talking about uh, an economic catastrophe that would unfold if the U.S. defaulted. Uh, And so avoiding default is a must do for the u.s congress we have a solemn obligation to get it done and i'm going to work hard to make sure that we do get it done and how can people get in touch with you if they need to as always it's ossoff.senate.gov it is my pleasure to serve the people of georgia it doesn't matter if you were for me or against me when i was a candidate i work for the entire state we're here to help you with anything that you need, veterans who need help, military families who need help. you got issues with the IRS. Uh, we can uh, help in many ways. The federal government can be infuriating to navigate, and my staff specializes at helping you solve problems. Again, it's ossoff.senate.gov. And, Martha, love to your family. As always, great to join you on the program. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. As we are worrying about the same, you know, debates that we have all the time here, Mm -hmm. uh, across the pond, they're getting ready for a coronation. And Lee Cohen, who has been with us before, who is a fellow at the Bow Group and also writes about all things uh, royal, uh, is joining us because he's going to be there. Lee, how are you? Martha, I am delighted to be with you, and you are my last interview before I set off for overseas, which I am so excited to welcome this new king. So tell us about this whole experience. You're heading over there. What are some of the things you're going to be doing? 
So, um, first and foremost, I'll be uh, in my capacity as a senior fellow of the Danube Institute. I'll be delivering a conference on monarchy, uh, on European monarchy, uh, and, you know, with the linchpin being uh, the coronation. And uh, for my part of this uh, uh, presentation, I'll be talking about why monarchy is so interesting to Americans, even though uh, we we rejected monarchy at our founding back in 1776. So why is it you think we're still so interested in it? Because I'm a woman of the certain age, Lee, and I got up for the, you know, the wedding, Diana and Charles's wedding. I got up for Diana's funeral. Uh, Charles visited my college when I was in uh, college, long before he married Diana. I got up for everything related to the queen. I'm one of those women, right? What is it about it? Well, you know, I think it's several things. Um, in America, we're a celebrity-obsessed culture, and monarchy, of course, is not celebrity. It's the furthest thing from celebrity uh, to uh, the people that live under it. They, the The British have a very intimate relationship with their head of state, uh, who is also their uh, head of government, and that is now King Charles III. And it's something that I think Americans don't understand. All we see are the celebrity aspects. But I think also involved in this, Martha, is you always want what you can't have. Yes, it's true. We rejected uh, monarchy and uh, perhaps falsely demonized George III, who was not the tyrant uh, that he is portrayed to be. That's what we're taught in schools, and that's what they had to say to the American populace back then to get people psyched up to fight this war against the British. The Americans were British. The American settlers were British, so they were, in effect, fighting against their own people. It was a civil war fought on the other side of the Atlantic. But back again to your question, what makes uh, monarchy for us so tantalizing uh, it I believe is the celebrity aspect and the Brits do pomp and pageantry better than anyone oh absolutely that's what it is for me it is being able to watch all this stuff go off perfectly you know in the same way they've done it for a thousand years that's what's so interesting to me that's exactly right. And over in this country, we're a very wealthy country, uh, used to being able to buy anything. But even people in Hollywood, even in Montecito, <laughs> where the uh, Duke and Duchess of Sussex live, you can't buy that kind of pageantry. You can't buy Westminster Abbey. You can't buy Buckingham Palace. You can't buy Windsor Castle. Lee Cohen is a senior fellow at the Danube Institute, also with the Bow Group, and uh, he writes a lot of columns. And I'm glad you mentioned Montecito because I'm going to finish this interview just kind of asking about that whole situation because it does, uh, you know, I for me personally, this is a family situation. And what Prince Harry has done is he's aired the dirty laundry of the family without the family really having an opportunity to work it out privately i mean it just went out there because i don't think he made any effort to work it out privately he says he did but i don't believe it and so he's going to go by himself he's going to nobody's going to talk to him <laughs> and he might get booed so this is going to be very interesting isn't it this is going to be interesting as i pointed out in a, in a opinion piece i wrote for fox last week um Meghan Markle's decision to not attend the coronation was the best decision, but for all the wrong reasons. Um, they, she is totally being disrespectful to her father-in-law, who just happens to be the king, who just happens to have the biggest day of his life coming up on May 6th. When he was there for her, her own father couldn't come to her wedding due to a health issue, and that, that was the official report. And so Charles Harry asked him, would you step in and support Meghan and walk her down the aisle? And Charles said, absolutely, whatever Meghan needs. And that's 
he, he has stood by that all the way through, and it is just showing such disrespect on her part. Uh, by the way, there's someone else who's shown great disrespect, and that's the President of the United States, Joe Biden, who, um, uh, who is disgracing the nation, by uh, our nation, and the special relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. by not attending uh the coronation he was invited he's not attending he last week flew to ireland and basked in his irish identity and heritage and this week with our most important staunchest strongest ally who's our partner in war fighting and intelligence he's decided i'm not going to go to their most important historic day in 73 years that's a disgrace well and he could have i understand the travel is hard on someone his age but he could have moved the irish trip a week and martha, i mean it would have martha, been easy <laughs> martha come on you say you're a woman of a certain age you are a babe in the woods a <laughs> youngster compared to him but even having said that you know he, he's got a private plane and he doesn't travel like the rest of us it would be very easy for him to go show his respect so i went to ireland last week on a vacation and when we landed in dublin we drove we went right by air force one <laughs> No. <laughs> so well, there was Air I Force hope you One, your tongue out, <laughs> and yeah, and three other airplanes, United States of America, and then there were a bunch of C one thirties too. So it was a big carbon footprint that got him over to Ireland and back. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, he should go. He should go, but he's not going to go. He's going to send Jill instead, and you know we'll see how all of that goes. Lee Cohen, I hope you have a fantastic trip. I hope you try some of the uh, the coronation. Um, uh, what's it called? Quiche. Cor- coronation quiche. quiche. And I've heard it's good. I've seen some people that have tried to build to uh, bake it. So I've heard it's good, but a little pricey. Martha, I look forward to talking to you when I come back and uh, telling you all about what I witnessed at the coronation. And Tesco's is opening up a pub just for the coronation. <laughs> Well, I'll have to stop in. That's right. Lee Cohen, thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great and safe trip. Thank you so much for having me. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.